All right, here we are. Welcome to week three, the first day of Muse 360. Um, we are about to move on from disco rap. I know you're very sad about that. Um, so we're going to move on from the uh, unitards and, you know, leopard flavored scarfs of the disco era and the 15 minute long Coke wraps um, onto the more street authentic uh, style of rap from the 80s. Uh, talking a lot about Run DMC and Def Jam Records. And we'll also dip into um, Eric B and Rakim, some Public Enemy, a lot of sort of real signature sounds from the era. I'm here out in the garden area at the homestead hanging out. My wife out back chilling, gardening. My son's stomping around. Got the chicks out here. We had uh, one of our favorite girls got sniped by a, uh, a bobcat that my wife scared off yesterday. She got sniped on Friday, so letting the chickens out and hanging out here with them on this beautiful day um, near Goat's Beard. So uh, anyways, yeah, we're going to talk about, you know, rap authenticity in the streets, you know, like, you know, street form of music. We're going to talk a lot about the technology and technical developments that uh, came through the 80s. Um, it's not to say like we're covering the 80s. Uh, there's just so so much and there's so so much different stuff uh, that we will dip into throughout throughout the term, but we'll look at a lot of the advancements um, in style and technique that happened during this time period. Um, but I mean, from 1979 to 1982, you know, really what happened was hip hop as a street culture, right? It's a street culture, like it happened on the streets. You know, the jams were on the streets. It, it died off. I'm talking the dance, um, you know, uh, the graffiti actually kind of stuck around. Um, B-boying became kind of not cool. MCing became not cool. DJing became way fucking not cool. Like, and it was like the coolest shit. And it became so not cool uh, to be a DJ. So, uh, but that all died off. I mean, it, the fad was over and it was all about rap, you know, um, People thought, you know, I mean, you, you got to understand, you know, y'all, y'all know as, as younger people, you know, uh, things, you know, fads die, you know, what was once cool, what was once amazing, you know, one day is, is not, you know, and I mean, for, for a lot of younger people, it's, it's a week or it's a couple days, you know, now, you know, back then it was a couple years, but you know, the rap records displaced the cultural element. And a lot of these kids who were hip hop heads that did hip hop as a live performance, you know, improvisational culture, I mean, they grew up, they got jobs, they got locked up. A lot of them became junkies, um, moved on to other things, you know. Um, it kind of was what it was, they just moved on, you know, but people were still doing it but it was in smaller circles. Now what happened is, we're talking about New York City primarily, right? The hip hop cultural stuff just started really, you know, taking off in other cities, you know, um, and other places of the world, which is kind of kind of dope, um, you know, kind of moved, moved on. So it stayed alive in Philly, it stayed alive, alive in, other, in other parts, but, uh, you know, in New York City, it became less cool and rap was the thing, like making records was the thing. Um, I think to understand so much of, you know, when we talked about subcultural uh, incorporation, um, I don't know if you can see that coffee cup on, on the bottom. It says I'm a douche. Uh, I'll get you a nice view of it later. It's my favorite coffee cup. But, you know, we talk about subcultural incorporation, you know, uh, of hip hop and the hip hop culture, you know, uh, it's really important to mention some things here, right? And so what I'll talk about, if we look at this, these images, we talked about Fab Five Freddy a little bit, and uh, Deborah Harry of Blondie in our last unit, um, you know, and sort of got to that point and mentioned those people. But Fab Five Freddy is like the total link between um, downtown, so Manhattan, and the boogie down, you know, uptown, boogie down Bronx, um, you know, scene. And, and what he really did is he linked uh, primarily Zulu Nation DJs like Africa Bambada and DJ Jazzy J um, with 
people uptown and you had these people, you know, so uh, Cool Lady Blue um, who started, you know, these these new wave sort of parties and then wanted to like, basically throw hip hop parties in uh, Manhattan at the at Negril and then the Roxy and, you know, through, I believe through Fat Five Freddy, you know, she kind of got like linked up with um, those those DJs, you know, Michael Holman um, was like a Wall Street dude who uh, got into real heavy with what we call break exploitation. So he managed, I believe, the dynamic rockers, and he he was real seminal in bringing um, the rock steady steady crew, b boy crew, uh, to the uh, grill and the Roxy, um, and then obviously Deborah Harry. Uh, Deborah Harry. The important thing is, like, Fat Puff Freddy's sort of at the nexus of, like, connecting, um, you know, hip-hop, which was a black culture, totally 100%, you know, production, consumption, black and brown, with New Wave, which was, like, and punk, you know, which was white, you know, a white culture in uh, downtown and Manhattan area. And he brought these, these groups together, and I've already mentioned sort of the importance of this. Um, but connecting them and, the, and these groups realized they had something in common, like they had totally different styles, totally different backgrounds, um, but they had a love of like this subversive new uh, forms of art and, and music and they actually really vibed out, you know, um, on it. And, um, but it's really important to mention this because, you know, Fab Five Freddy is really, when we talk about incorporating subcultures in the mainstream, you know, he was incredibly seminal in all of that happening. For, for hip hop, I um, mean, he was in hip hop movies. I mean, he just really connected all the dots with a lot of these, you know, people. And I will say, a lot of white people um, who were intrigued by the art form because it was so intriguing. It had lived in this small bubble um, in, in in the Bronx, you know. So in the early '80s, that came out of the Bronx and into other boroughs um, of of. Uh, of, of New York City, which helped to kind of blow up the the art form and help to monetize it, um, you know, in different ways.